You are listening to Concussion 101, a patient's guide to getting ahead again. Episode 12, More Than Meets the Eye, Part 2. Your host, Dr. Mona Ubi, behavioral optometrist at the York Region Concussion Clinic, is back in this episode to continue her discussion about visual inefficiencies post-concussion and explain the role of glasses and vision therapy in rehabilitating the visual system. Enjoy! Welcome to our 12th podcast episode. It's me again, Dr. Chug, the sports physician at the YRCC. I'm back again today with Dr. Mona Ubi to continue our discussion on visual system deficits after a concussion. In the first part of these episodes on vision, we reviewed the binocular vision system and we talked about visual symptoms that commonly affect patients after a concussion. In this episode, we will cover visual rehabilitation. So let's start off with glasses. Glasses are often prescribed to help with easing visual difficulties. A lot of patients with concussions are prescribed a small prescription or even prism glasses to help improve their visual symptoms. Absolutely. So I find that people with concussions have increased sensitivity to the mildest amount of nearsightedness, farsightedness, or astigmatism. Usually, I wouldn't even consider giving this tiny amount to a patient, but for someone with a concussion, it really can make a huge difference in helping with balancing the visual system, reducing eye strain, and providing more energy for that patient to heal. I've had a few patients where this was all they needed, and after a few weeks of wearing their glasses, their symptoms have gone, and they no longer needed their glasses. This probably has to do with the brain's general hyperexcitability post-concussion. There are functional MRI studies showing that concussion patients have to use many more neural networks to perform tasks that non-concussed people require. This just translates to using the brain less efficiently. And as mentioned before, the brain is an energy hog. So as fatigue sets in, all of the brain's functions will be compromised. This is why it's so important to treat visual consequences post-concussion in a biopsychosocial model of health. Let me take us back to the prescription lenses for a sec, because a lot of patients ask us about this. Now, I suppose the most obvious use of prescription glasses post-concussion is to get patients to 20-20 if, if they aren't already there, as it would be hard to rehabilitate those higher order functions in the visual pyramid like visual efficiency and visual information processing without the ability to see clearly or having good visual integrity. That's right. Often, patients have mild imperfections in their ability to see crystal clear, but it doesn't bother them or they can usually compensate for it if they don't have a concussion. I'll frequently have patients tell me they had an eye exam not long before the concussion and they were given a prescription, but they never really filled it because they didn't need it or the fact that their vision has always been perfect until after their concussion. This changes post-concussion and patients will often feel that change in their vision. Sometimes you add things like prism or tint, which makes a big difference for the patient as well. Yep, so they don't work for everyone, but when they work, they can really make a big difference. Prisms can help with double vision, eye strain, or just help the patient with improving their ability to process their visual space. The effects of prism on the visual system can actually be amazing. Just a little while ago, I actually had a patient who needed a cane to help her walk, and she didn't have difficulty with her hips or her her legs or anything like that. It was just that she didn't know how to accurately process her visual space since having her concussion. The really cool thing was when I prescribed her these glasses containing prism, she no longer needed her cane. She actually walked out for getting her cane behind her. That's such a satisfying feeling. Yeah, exactly. I see examples of this all the time. For many patients rehabilitating from concussions, they feel that they have to work for every gain they make. This is one that can feel like a gift, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Light sensitivity is not usually helped as dramatically, but you often make a difference here too with the lenses you prescribe. Tinted glasses can help some some of the patients tolerate that fluorescent lighting or the computer screens just because of how bright everything is. The tint is such a small amount, and it's nowhere near as dark as sunglasses, and I really, really do not recommend wearing sunglasses indoors. The constant use of sunglasses indoors can actually lead to increased light sensitivity. So in some cases, 
all the person really needs is actually just an anti-reflective coating because that helps to reduce the light scatter and it ha- actually does also improve visual comfort. Now, what about those patients that have eye strain or discomfort doing near tasks like reading or computer work, but have been told that their vision is 20-20? I know that you often prescribe lenses to help with these people also. So a small reading prescription can sometimes be used to help words stay in focus while reading. This can help reduce that strain on the accommodative system, and it can actually sometimes reduce the strain on the virgin system as well. Like we discussed earlier, sometimes that brain just isn't sending the information correctly to the lens so that it can change shape the way that it needs to in order to bring objects into clarity. Or the lens can bring things into focus, but it just needs a lot of effort to do so. So by providing reading glasses, we can actually reduce the demand placed on the lens to make up for that difference. You said that a plus lens can also reduce strain on the virgin system. This won't be as intuitive for our listeners to understand. Do you mind uh, talking a bit more about that? So, for example, to bring objects into focus as they get closer to us, we actually have to cross our eyes a bit and we have to change that shape of our lens to bring it into focus. So some people might actually cross their eyes a bit more than they need to and change the shape of their lens a little bit less to do this, while other people might do the opposite. So they kind of cross their eyes a little bit less and they change the shape of their lens a bit more. Basically, there are neural connections between these two skills, so they are linked, that accommodative and convergence system. Convergence can drive accommodation, and accommodation can also drive convergence. So the behavioral optometrist must have a good understanding of this connection. Yeah. And the strengths and weaknesses in the post-concussion patient's visual skills to skillfully prescribe prescription glasses. Yeah, exactly. So ultimately, we want the patient to feel better and function better to ease up on some of that energy that's being drained by the brain. The focus is not just on illness. It's on wellness. I feel that was said in some of our previous episodes. Yeah, it's a nice saying. Uh, And it kind of catches the gist of what we're trying to do in post-concussion people. Mm -hmm. Um, To go back to the lenses for a sec, most people who have both distance and reading prescriptions get these broken up into two separate glasses post-concussion to lessen the symptoms and improve balance. Sometimes I see you go with bifocals or progressives for these people also. Yeah, you know, it really depends on the person and and like the activities they want to do and what their visual difficulties are, to be honest. I won't say that I do this often. Um, If if there are issues with balance, I will always recommend separate distance and reading prescriptions because having both in one pair can actually increase the risk of falling. It really depends on what they need in order to help with their recovery. Mm -hmm. And most of us have seen concussion patients with binasal occlusion or those little pieces of tape applied to the inner aspect of their glasses. Can you discuss this a bit? Yeah, so I do use this sometimes. Uh, It really depends on the person, and what this does is it actually helps to separate their visual world, and it gives their visual system a point of reference. It can really help the the world just feel more, more stable and more calm. Again, it doesn't help everybody, but I will test this if the glasses seem um, like they're not good enough. So in the context of the analogy we gave earlier, it's kind of like an anchor for the anchor of that visual system. Yeah, that's exactly true. So most commonly, we rely on vision therapy to improve the visual system's deficits. Can you help our listeners understand what vision therapy is and what it entails? So vision therapy is really a form of rehabilitation for that visual system. And we use visual exercises or activities to help build visual skills and retrain the visual system on how to work efficiently. Basically, vision therapy helps to retrain visual skills that most of us have developed naturally in infancy to younger adulthood. But for some reason, it's been compromised because of the concussion. Or sometimes the patient already had compromised binocular vision before the injury and just wasn't aware. We get a lot of patients who ask, Doc, could I have had this issue before? And the answer is that probably many did but never knew. Many patients develop other skills, visual skills, to compensate for inefficiencies or accept that the way, that's the way they perform and that's the limit of their capabilities. And some did get symptoms with visual tasks, but perhaps they were nonspecific symptoms like headache. Uh, headaches can occur for many other reasons, so um, it can be challenging to correlate it with visual inefficiencies. I mean, most of us are not even aware of the visual skills we use other than being able to see clearly. That's a good point. 
This is what we call subclinical inefficiencies, but usually we specifically diagnose the particular inefficiency. And there is evidence to show that these patients are more likely to have visual consequences post-concussion and have more prolonged recoveries. So it is possible. At the center of ours where we just see concussions, we are seeing proportionately more of the population who had these subclinical visual inefficiencies. And the treatment for many of these patients, if their conditions were detected before the concussion, would have been vision therapy. Yes, so vision therapy involves working on visual skills specifically chosen to remedy the difficulties that that particular patient is having, taking into consideration what their visual system can handle. After we get to practice the activities together, the patient takes those exercises home to work on once a day. Usually the patient is brought in once a week to check on progress and advance the therapy if possible. Vision therapy has been around for decades, although for some reason it's not well known outside the concussion circle yet. But it's often used to rehabilitate children with congenital binocular vision issues. Why do you think it's taken so long to catch on? To be honest, I'm not sure. Um, There isn't any question about the validity of vision therapy as a field. I mean, there are very reputable schools all over the world that do lots of research in this area. There are many textbooks and devices that are used to rehabilitate patients. There are clinical trials which have demonstrated that vision therapy does work and that the improvements stay after completing vision therapy. I feel like it probably has to do with the fact that although vision difficulties are a common problem in concussion patients, it's fortunately, you know, isn't really an issue for most of the population. You mean non-concussion people? Exactly. Exactly. Like the non-concussion general population people. Mm -hmm. So not too many practitioners get into it. For example, let's take convergence insufficiency, which is really that inability for the eyes to accurately converge and sustain convergence at near. In the concussion population, it has a prevalence of about 49%. And in the general population, about 10. So, you know, that's one really important part to kind of think about. Also, rehabilitating vision issues can take some time. It's the norm that, you know, for some patients to rehabilitate, it takes about 10 to 40 sessions. And some don't have the financial means or the time to pursue vision therapy. You know, when you think about it, 10% in the general population, that, that's quite a lot, actually. It is. But, you know, some of these people actually, they, they just, they might have convergence insufficiency, but they don't, um, they might be compensating for it well. So it's subclinical again. Yeah, They're exactly. functioning fine. There's no reason to go see a doctor about it. No. If they're, or if, sometimes the other things are to interrupt, but is that they just don't know that that's what their symptoms are for. So they might, you know, have right. avoidance activities where they're avoiding reading or doing a near tasks or they limit their time doing that right and they think it's just that they don't like doing it right but it's really because their eyes are having issues right so those non-specific symptoms exactly. I actually uh we're seeing a carpenter right now who doesn't really do much near work and we did an eye exam on him and he has many deficiencies mm-hmm. or inefficiencies and he doesn't really care because most of his symptoms are gone now and he says he never reads at yeah. all. He doesn't that, do any near tasks. That's so important as well. I've seen at least a few where, you know, um, some people, their, their world is all at a distance. They rarely use their computer. They rarely read. Maybe use their phone once in a while for text messaging. And because text messages are such a limited time, you know, how long are you really texting for? It's like a 30 second, maybe a minute thing. And then you're looking away from your phone. They don't do it for long enough to feel those symptoms. Although there is belief that um, if you leave those inefficiencies unrehabilitated and they were to sustain another concussion, their concussion may be prolonged or more complicated. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I know I'm just going to go back to the popularity of vision therapy Uh, I know sports vision has started taking off in the athletic population, which is basically an extension of vision therapy just applied to peak performance. So I feel like this may be creating some awareness of uh, visual skills beyond 2020. Yeah, exactly. So it's really cool. It's something that I eventually am hoping to kind of get into. But in order to kind of see, uh, you know, one just has to go on YouTube to see the feats of visual skills by many of these high profile athletes. I know there's some cool things on Cristiano Ronaldo on YouTube about how he can uh, 
predict where like the ball is going to end up in yeah. pitch black just by seeing a, a fraction of of uh, where someone's foot is going to hit the ball. Yeah. And he can just extrapolate that to where it's going to end yeah. up. And uh, what are some of the side effects of vision therapy? The reason why I ask is we have had some patients who did vision therapy before coming to our center and didn't feel better. Some even felt worse. So how would you tell these patients that they need to do vision therapy again? So that's a really good question. Um, we touched on it a few times already, but as you mentioned earlier, there is a general hyperexcitability of the brain that makes patients more tired, more sensitive to sensory stimulation, and less efficient in handling mental processes. This type of situation is best treated in a multimodal, multidisciplinary environment. In fact, Many binocular vision abnormalities or inefficiencies, even in the non-concussion population, are best treated with energy management programs. So mindfulness, psychotherapy, and also sleep management with programs like cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Right. So doing vision therapy without managing stress, fatigue, or difficulty someone might be having with sleep uh, may kind of mitigate the effects from vision therapy. Yeah. Then there are medical conditions that can be associated with visual inefficiencies also, like malnutrition. Uh, we see actually a lot of females in particular, like they mm -hmm. might be eating like 1,400 calories mm -hmm. a day. And we're also getting them involved in an exercise program. So this is not enough calories. Another common medical issue we see is uh, thyroid issues, mm -hmm. uh, viruses, sinusitis, uh, sleep apnea. And then some of the medications they might be taking, sometimes even over-the-counter medications can affect visual inefficiencies. You know, then there's this whole postural control issue I mentioned before in my example of the patient who improved with PRISM. So on our website, we have a really good article that explains vision vestibular mismatch and some of the things that need to be considered when rehabilitating balance and vision. I won't go into too much detail about it, as I know we will be doing an episode about this in, in greater detail later. But generally, vision is only one part of the factor that controls posture. So if the patient has vestibular, somatosensory, or cognitive issues that are affecting their postural control, proprioception, and their kinesthesia, um, then the brain won't have an accurate picture of where the body and the head is in our environment. This can mitigate any potential benefits from vision therapy. Right. That's like saying if you want to focus a camera in a shaky hand, you need a steady hand first. We have a patient who actually attended a very reputable vision therapy clinic for six months for her visual issues to only feel worse. During our assessments, we realized that she had something called benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or simply BPPV. Mm -hmm. Many have heard of this referred to as crystals in the inner ear. Simple repositioning maneuvers helped her feel more grounded and corrected her nystagmus, or nystagmus is involuntary eye beating with certain motions. Um, she then needed rehabilitation to correct the way she had maladaptively been trying to use her visual system to compensate for the effects of the BPPV. So she wasn't aware she was doing this. She just did it. And that's what the brain does. It tries to make things right. And it works with what it has. So once this was done, she was then back to the same vision therapy clinic to rehabilitate her binocular vision issues. But this time she had success. Right because there's more layers of her story and those were addressed and treated. The whole person was treated rather than just the eyes and that's something that I find so important. The visual system is only one important part of the concussion rehabilitation puzzle. And as specialists, we tend to think of the person as the part of the body that we specialize in. I remember in medical school, um, there were arguments often between the anesthesiologists and the surgeons. Mm -hmm. And the surgeons always wanted the blood pressure lower during surgery so that there would be less bleeding, uh, quicker operating times, um, less complications, so they could fix up the gut or the bone quicker, so on, and more effectively. The anesthesiologists always wanted the blood pressure higher so that the patient didn't go into shock. So, you know, good thing that the anesthesiologist and the surgeon were working together. Outcomes are always better in a multidisciplinary, multimodal environment. So, for example, even attentional issues can be part of the reason for reading difficulties post-concussion. Without addressing the attentional issues, we're going to get less returns from vision therapy. And without addressing the visual issues, we're going to get less returns rehabilitating cognition. It's true. It's like a clinical Rubik's Cube, as you like to say. So, in fact, although this episode is about vision, we rarely start vision therapy right away. 
And I have actually found this to be a huge benefit for patients. And to be honest, it makes my life a lot easier. The entire body really is connected. Practically, I find that vestibular therapy, neck, mindfulness, and biofeedback can help give the patient tools to help cope with their visually related symptoms that might be flared up during vision therapy. And that's a really common complaint that I hear about when people start vision therapy is the number of symptoms that start to come on. Mm -hmm. So often the patient's visual system will also improve considerably just from getting these treatments. I actually wrote about a case which I posted on our website of a patient who had tons of visual difficulties when I first assessed her. And then I had referred her actually into our concussion program. By the time that she was ready to start vision therapy with me, there were so few visual difficulties remaining. It was amazing. You know, in many ways, when you think about it, uh, this is kind of mimicking normal human development. So it's not like the visual system develops early on perfectly. It's, It's a work in progress and it's interlace with somatosensory development and vestibular development all at their own different paces. Yeah. So the visual system actually isn't done um, just developing until ac- after we're born. While we're babies, we're actually learning to work our eyes together. We're learning to focus and all these other things. That's where crawling and, and walking and all these other things, you know, playing with toys and bringing it into our mouths, all of that stuff is really important in helping the visual system develop. When you, when you go look at YouTube videos of Cristiano Ronaldo pulling yeah. off visual feats like that, you can see how the visual system continues to develop even into young adult, adulthood. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, this theme of finding a cohesive treating team keeps resurfacing during this podcast series. What can a patient do to help their visual system until they can find their healthcare team? One thing I always stress is try to avoid wearing sunglasses indoors. It's okay to wear them when you're outside, but if you're wearing them all the time, it can get really hard for your system to adapt to normal light levels again. You know, just to give you an example, I have a patient who had a concussion 13 or 14 years ago, and she was wearing sunglasses for the first 10 years of that concussion. We've been slowly trying to reduce that tint, and it can get really costly financially because I have to reduce that tint 5 or 10% at a time. If indoor lights are bothering you, Try to change those lights to incandescent light bulbs. I know these aren't really energy efficient, but they don't have this invisible flicker that other light bulbs do, which is what tends to really bother patients with light sensitivity. Another thing, try to avoid technology if possible. But, you know, I do understand how difficult it can be to avoid computer screens when you need to get work done. If you must use that computer or your phone, just, you know, try to reduce the brightness and make that print a bit larger. You can also try to use anti-glare filters for the computer screen if you can find these. On your phone, you can turn on that blue light filter, which really does tend to help. For computers, there's also these devices you can rent or buy that transforms your screen into a paper-like looking uh, interface. Yeah, those help too. If you're having difficulty with reading, another thing you can do is listen to audiobooks or use a ruler to help your eyes move more smoothly from one line to the next. But I think the most important thing I can advise is taking breaks as soon as you feel those symptoms. Take the break for as long as you need to let your symptoms recover. Studies have shown that a natural recovery can take place over an entire year post-injury. So I always stress to not overdo it or you could be causing regression in any natural recovery your visual system has made. So we covered a lot of information in this episode, Dr. Mona. Can you give us a quick recap of the take-home points? Okay, so here's my top three. Number one, vision can still be affected in a concussion, even if you have 20-20 vision. Number two, there are things that can help with your visual recovery. Look for an optometrist who has experience working with concussions. So again, they might go by the names of either neurooptometrist, developmental optometrist, or behavioral optometrist. If you don't know if they have experience with concussions, just ask. If they don't, they might be able to point you into the right direction. And number three, multidisciplinary care is important. The experts will know what you will require and who to send you to in order to get the help you need. Thank you, Dr. Mona, for that excellent and informative interview. I'm sure this information will help many of our listeners all over the world. My pleasure. To our listeners... 
We will have more episodes coming soon. Until the next time, so long and take care. Thank you for listening to the Concussion 101 podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and leave us a review. For more information about concussion-related topics, visit us at www.yorkconcussion.ca. Stay tuned for our next episode.